Whether you're a developer or an artist in game development, we find ourselves handling a variety of assets. But there is one asset that is often overlooked, and it's the most important one of all, empathy. Hey everyone, I'm Darren, a programmer at Cerebral Fix. And I'm Jed, senior 2D artist, also at Cerebral Fix. Uh, we are a work for hire game studio based in Christchurch. Uh, me and Darren are working on the same project together. It is a mobile game in the phaser engine, but we can't say much more than that. Yeah, but here are some of the other titles that we've worked on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's one. <laughs> yeah, we worked on that. Yeah, but we're not here to talk about that. Uh, we can't. <laughs> but what are we here to talk about? Well, let us give you a scenario. Imagine this. <laughs> You're working on a project for an external client, and your PO or product owner tasks your team with implementing a new feature for a game. We'll refer to the PO and client a lot, but this is basically just whoever is writing the tickets and making the decisions. Yeah, we'll say it's a UI feature, um, just to keep it simple, a new screen. So first, the task is issued. The PO gets a request from the client, they write up an art ticket, and send it through to the artist to do their arty thing. Next, the creative cycle takes place. Art goes ahead and prepares some mockups and concepts and runs them by the client and the PO for creative approval and feedback. After a number of iterations and back and forths, uh, the art will eventually reach a point where the PO feels it's quite safe to start implementing just to keep the devs unblocked and to make sure that all the creative approvals and stuff are coming in on time. Yeah. So then, the creative handover takes place. Ish. Uh, the artists export everything they have, all the concepts and all the assets, and uh, package, it up, package it all up for the devs, and then they parachute out to their next mission. At this point, the dev task gets planned. The PO makes the dev ticket, they write the description, attach the mock-up, uh, and then put it in Sprint for implementation. And at some point, the dev team then picks up the task, matching the mock-ups to the assets that were provided. Additionally, we'll need to do anything like calculating the positions and working out the anchoring uh, to make it all dynamic. Yeah. So then, you know, in the end, the art is implemented by the divs, but it's feeling a little off. Uh, there will be some back and forth between the artists and the divs, but neither side is quite getting what the other wants or needs. Um, but eventually, we ship the thing and we just move on. Rinse and repeat. <laughs> uh, does that sound familiar? It does. Well, it was <laughs> all wrong. <laughs> um, what went wrong in that scenario, and why was it wrong? Let's break it down. Well, at the start of our example, the divs and artists didn't communicate. The artists didn't know what the technical requirements were, so there was no way to know if the assets they were planning to make were viable. Uh, conscious decisions are not made around how the color or animations will be implemented. Is it going to be a, a sprite sheet or programmatically animated? The devs might not fully understand the artist's intent either, or all of the creative requirements from the client. Hmm. Assumptions were made about how the thing should be built. Assumptions were made about uh, what our teammates are expected to do and assumptions were made about what each other knows. Did we really understand what we were asking of one another? Right off the bat, we we're already off on the wrong foot here. So, next slide, the creative cycle. Okay, so the artists are doing creative iterations with the client, but it's in isolation. Creative approval is the sole priority here, so the artists are only focused on getting their concepts to match the client's vision. Any decisions that have dev considerations could be missed. And as a result, the art concepts might get approved by the client, but in reality may not be technically feasible. I can think of a few occasions where the client pushed for some beautiful visual treatment in the concepting phase. They were pushing for these amazing animations and post-processing effects and everything. It was all going to be super cool. But when it came time to actually build the thing, we quickly found that it was not going to be technically feasible at all. Like the implementation was going to be too complicated, or maybe the um, uh, the memory or pr uh, performance costs were going to be too high. See, artist. Um, <laughs> uh, that wasn't on the script. So the devs were being, <laughs> the devs were being left with all of these uh, super avoidable headaches, all because they weren't being clued in when they could have been. So the creative handover. Now the creative handover step takes place. R completes their exports and leaves to work on their next task. This is because typically art needs to be quite ahead of the divs to make sure that yeah, they're getting all their approvals and the divs are unblocked. But this leads to asynchronous participation. The latest version of the mockup is whatever was last sent to the client. And in some cases, while art is away, additional feedback cycles might have even happened without them. Uh, maybe the client was doing some redlining and like drawer overs of their own and adding their own notes, all behind the artist's back, as, as it were. Um, but the artists don't know. 
But whatever comes out of that, that is what the PO eventually sends off to the devs to implement. Problem there is that an official production step did not take place, a production mockup is not created, and implementation details are not communicated, or they're very minimal. This makes it super difficult for the devs to pick up afterwards. Um, in an, a naive, perhaps, attempt to save some time, we split up the department's estimations. We have a separate art meeting and a separate dev meeting. You know, most of the time, we're talking about some data structure we have to use or some API call we need to make, so it makes a bit of sense. We assume that the artists don't want to sit through all of that, but now some perspective is lost. We lose out on all the times that an artist can interject with some clarification or some correction, and vice versa. And most importantly, what matters to the artist or the client isn't quite captured or communicated either. Um, so now, art is ostensibly busy doing the next thing. It's best not to interrupt them. And in, the, in order to get the feature implemented, the devs are left to decipher the mock-up on their own. You know, for some years, the developers have been manually calculating positioning of assets based on the mock-up. One day, I got bored and turned to Jed and asked, Hey, Jed, what's the position of this button? Oh, gee, I don't know. Let me check. <laughs> and he says, uh, <laughs> and then he grabs the, the selection tool in Photoshop and tells me. Uh, it says here that it's 2.8% of the total screen height. In like four seconds. It's way faster than I was doing it beforehand. You know, it makes so much more sense for an artist to provide that information than for a dev to be calculating it after the fact. Yeah, like I'm right here, man. <laughs> Happy to do it. It was pretty common for the devs not to want to bother the artists with these minor requests. So there's our scenario, and a lot went wrong there. But we'll narrow it down to a few core issues. Assumptions. Siloing. Empathy. And accountability. Developers and artists, designers, testers, audio engineers, word or a good or is, product owners, anyone else we can jam in that sentence, <laughs> we're all people, and we all make assumptions about each other and about ourselves. We assume that people understand exactly what we're saying. We assume people will see the effort that we're putting into it. We assume that someone else will handle it, or someone else has already thought of this thing. Yeah. We make assumptions about what we should be doing, about what we can be doing, and even what we're allowed to be doing. So in our scenario, the artists assumed the devs knew exactly how to implement their art. Likewise, the devs assumed that the artists were fully aware of all the technical limitations and considerations and that it was being brought up in the creative cycle. The terminology and vocabulary that we use is often loaded with assumptions. Within departments, this is an issue, but across departments, this is especially bad. If I ask Jed for a concept, uh, what am I going to get from that? An asset, a sketch, a doodle, a high rendering painting thing? <laughs> am I expecting to get it in three minutes or three days? Uh, I personally haven't worked with so many 3D artists, so if I need an asset from them, does that include animations and rigging or whatever else goes on? Yeah, obviously, you need to make sure that you're speaking the same language as your teammates. I can remember the day that the devs came to me for the first time and uh, offered the phaser animation implementation documentation, and it was like getting the Rosetta Stone. <laughs> All of a sudden, the artists and the devs were speaking the same language and were able to like, communicate in precise terms exactly what they want from one another. Like, we were able to talk in like, exact curves and, and code and things like that. So that was all really efficient and good. But the most important thing there was that now the artists had more context as to what the limitations were in engine. And that wasn't previously known. Yeah. When you're in a fast-paced environment like game development, always working to deadlines, it's easy to make assumptions. They're the mental shortcuts that we all use to make things manageable. But assumptions lead to a lot of inefficient workflows and avoidable mistakes. Eventually, left unchecked, they just become the way things are. So I have this relatively sarcastic <laughs> saying that goes, the wrong thing left in the game long enough eventually becomes the right thing. So I, it's <laughs> sad, but true, right? Um, but don't let that be the case with your attitudes and your processes, or your assets, for that matter. So when you're going through your work step by step and checking off all the things in your process, it's important to slow down and ask yourself, was it a decision or a default? Siloing occurs at all levels of game development. You can be siloed in your own work. I take the ticket, I do the task, I move it on. You can be siloed in your discipline. The devs build the features and the artists make the assets. You can be siloed in your project. You know, we hit our milestones, we deliver our product. And you can be siloed at your studio. We ship our games, and we do our own thing. 
but each of these levels of siloing has a cost. If you are personally siloed in your own work, you can easily become disengaged from the rest of your team. The work isn't just the work, it's also the admin that goes in to ensure that the next person knows what to do with what you're giving them. Uh, and to do this properly, you need to actually be engaged with what is happening around you. You need to be working within your team, not outside of it. Um, yeah, it's not just about you. Where your work ends, someone else's begins. If your discipline is siloed, the devs don't know what the artist is doing, the artists don't know what the devs are doing, design is playing with a spreadsheet somewhere, <laughs> it, it leads to kicking things over the fence and assuming the work is handled somewhere else by someone else. Department siloing leads to a lack of context in the work and it can make the game elements feel uh, disjointed and arbitrary. Hmm. A siloed project produces different problems to self or team siloing. Uh, if your project is siloed, your learnings aren't being shared with the rest of the studio. Are other people making the same mistakes as you? Are they solving the same problems as you? Uh, are you accumulating knowledge and insight, or is everyone just starting from scratch each time? There have been times in our studio where people have gone off to do their own uh, work on exciting new proposals and initiatives, only to realize that someone else was already doing the same thing or had done it before. But there was no visibility. People's intents and um, learnings weren't being shared. If your studio is siloed, are you aware of what the games industry is doing? Where it's heading or what other games are out there? Are you learning from the mistakes of others? And are you sharing your learnings and tools? A rising tide lifts all boats, like the hit game Dredge by Black Salt Games. <laughs> 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 Everyone who benefits as we grow as an industry. So how do you handle siloing? Well, some of the ways that we've solved siloing uh, to ensure that everyone in the team is properly engaged and involved in what everyone else is doing, uh, to ensure that everyone has all the context they need to deliver their part, and also to ensure that any insight and knowledge gained from different projects is being shared out with the rest of the studio and even the community. Remember, where your work ends, someone else's begins. So make sure that everyone is collaborating as smoothly as possible. If you're honest with yourself, how well do you know your teammates? You could be working with each other for years, but do you know what's important to them? What motivates them? What do they enjoy doing? And what don't they enjoy doing? For that matter, do you really know what it takes to do their job? How much effort goes into it? And why they're making the decisions that they are? Some artists really, really, really just want to draw. Uh, some devs prefer back-end development to front-end. These are reasonably common takes about one another's disciplines that we were unaware of, actually. But it blew our minds that we had never taken the time to find these things out about one another. Yeah. <laughs> Knowing your team's passion levels is also super underrated in my opinion. If you're super passionate about your project and you've got all these ideas and everything is awesome, but your team is just kind of meh, that can really take the wind out of your sails. It might feel like you're putting in a lot more work than everyone else, or they're not pulling their weight. It's probably not that extreme, but it's surprising how much friction can come from a difference in enthusiasm. Equally, it can be difficult to work with people who are more passionate than you. It can be hard to approach people with problems that you've encountered or saying no to people's ideas. Yeah, if you don't understand what they're thinking and why they're doing the things that they're doing, you're going to struggle to accommodate for them when you need to. You're probably going to struggle with them in general. And you may even begin resenting them, these people on the other side of the fence. And it goes both ways. Without empathy, over time, this other department will be abstracted into this caricature, a scapegoat even, to broadly take the blame for everything that frustrates you, to project all of your, uh, yeah, or, yeah, that's bad. So get to know each other and just see where they're coming from. Ask questions and talk things out. One of the tools that we've found super helpful is running an empathy retro. Basically a meeting where you focus on improving empathy between your team members. First, you write down three things that frustrate you and three things that you find really rewarding. Then draw names out of a hat, and for whoever you got, try and guess what they put for each of them. Then reveal what they actually put, and compare and discuss. This is a great way to challenge, challenge the assumptions that you've made about each other. Accountability. What is accountability? Well, it's all the things related to your job outside of the job itself. It's the everything else. You've got to do the boring admin stuff. The meetings, the tickets, the trust falls. A sentiment I've had myself is that you're not working unless you're coding, or I haven't done any work today because I've been stuck in meetings. But part of your job is to go to meetings. It is to update the tickets and write documentation. You could say that the work was the meetings we had along the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to stay on top of your responsibilities. 
Uh, and on that note, it's important to clearly define where everyone's responsibilities begin and end. At a high level, this is all about finding where the onus sits. Uh, you want to avoid situations where anyone is unsure about who has ownership over a given task. We've had situations in the past where dev, art, and design were all in disagreement over who needed to define the requirements for a particular issue. Everyone was frustrated, uh, and the blame was being passed around like a hot potato. Uh, the team was struggling to settle on who was in charge of making the final call, uh, and so everyone was blocked as a result. Part of this was because some people were wearing multiple hats, so that's super cool that people can fulfill multiple roles. But in situations like that, where the lines are blurred, uh, it's even more important to have a clear understanding of who is responsible for what. Defining responsibilities is also important at a low level. What needs to be taken into account before and during handoffs? Are you doing that everything that you need to do? Are you giving the next person all the information that they need in order to do their role properly? Something that the devs were often feeling is, oh, the artists never give us the assets how we want. Um, there'd be issues in naming conventions, resolutions, file size, formats, all these things. But once you identify it, it's really easy to solve. You just have to have a conversation with them, work things out, define some guidelines. Like we talked about earlier, if your teammates aren't aware of the technical constraints, then of course they're not going to give you what you want. How can you expect someone to do something you haven't asked them to do? Just because it's important to you doesn't mean it is to them. Our lead artist put it best when he said that game dev is sort of like baking a cake. So the artists are the ones in charge of preparing all the ingredients, and the devs are the ones who do the baking. But issues arise when that communication is muddied. Uh, were the artists expected to beat the eggs, or did the devs want to do it? Um, who's mixing the better? And are we even all working from the same recipe in the first place? Just talk. Don't waste your time walking on eggshells. <laughs> You're all on the same side. You're all working towards the same goal. So set each other up for success. Be more deliberate in your handoffs. Don't kick things over the fence. That's no good. So OK, let's try this again. And this time, let's be more mindful of our assumptions. First, the task is issued, but it's drafted in collaboration with everybody to ensure that the technical limitations are properly considered for the feature as a whole. Then, design and dev plan the feature together. A wireframe is created to give art a better starting point and to properly convey all the considerations that need to be made. This time, the creative cycle will involve the whole team. Art will not only have their feedback loops with the client and the PO, but will also keep the rest of the team involved as well. These internal sense checks uh, keep everyone up to date with the latest changes in information. Next, the creative handover step takes place with the art department. When the PO gives their stamp of approval, uh, you know, art prepares the final mock-up. Art does it, not the client, not the PO. And of course, as part of that, implementation guidelines and a bill of materials are able to be uh, properly prepared and are definitely included. <laughs> now the dev task is drafted in collaboration with art and design. The PO lays out what the user-facing changes will look like, and then the team examines how the assets and, uh, and elements will be used to achieve that result. We walk through the implementation notes together and ensure that everyone understands what needs to be done. Finally, Dev implements the task in collaboration with the artist. The artist has made time specifically available for helping out, and so if anything comes up, the devs know that they're there to help, and we're not going to be bugging them with a minor request. So there, that feels a lot better, doesn't it? So after a lot of deep introspection and serious internal review, uh, we were able to develop a groundbreaking technique in order to effectively diagnose and resolve these issues going forward. And it goes something like this. Just talk. <laughs> Seriously, just talk. <laughs> yeah. uh, we did this. This is how this all started. Uh, Darren and I sat down, and we just talked. Uh, and we really got to know one another. We learned about each other's assumptions, motivations, frustrations, and even our core values. Uh, we then went on to investigate the rest of our studio. And we found that everyone also had a whole lot of assumptions about all kinds of things. A lot of the same assumptions as each other, in some cases. But no one was talking about them. Or if they did get talked about, it wasn't being shared out. There was no visibility. So it wasn't doing much good for the collective. So we realized that it was time to break the cycle. A great first step that we would recommend is for you to set aside some time to talk to someone from another department, ideally one-on-one. -on -one. Ask them what? the project is like on their end, and try to learn their motivations and frustrations. All that we can say is that this worked for us, but we believe that this could help your teams as well. 
We sent out a survey to our various departments and asked them these questions. Describe some assumptions that you've had about the other department. How did you deal with those assumptions? And what have you learned? And what is something that you wish that the other department, the other, the other, the other, the other department knew about working with you? We also asked them the same questions about their own department. Speaking of questions. And or on the app? We assumed there'd be more. <laughs> um, I'm interested in oh. the, the creative process or creative side of things. Sure. Um, thousands of paths of that can be a difficult conversation given the length of time that it each would take to come to a decision or to the direction you're going to go. Okay. So let's say you're taking the, the entire length of what we just discussed. How do you keep that conversation moving? How do you not feel like you're taking up people's time? Ah, uh, yes. That's um, kind of what we were getting at with the whole uh, like dev and art estimations being split up. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say that like you need to keep in mind what the end goal that you're trying to hit is, like to make sure that you're not talking in circles, because uh, that's <laughs> definitely a problem that comes up. Um, yeah, one of the, the tricky things is like, oh, you don't want to waste the artist's time because you're talking about a really technical thing. Um, and like maybe split that technical meeting out into its own thing. Like, oh, we're only discussing the implementation of this. But when you're doing the overview meeting, that's when everyone needs to be involved. Yeah, and the same is true on the other side. Yeah. Maybe the devs don't want to sit through all the creative discussions with the client or internally. Um, something that I guess worked for us is that we keep everyone involved like at the end of every sprint at least and yeah. we're trying to like make sure that everyone's like seeing the product together and like aware of the like, creative vision that we're moving in together um though maybe the devs aren't always involved in like the art stuff um yeah, yeah. certainly in the beginning everyone's involved in everything though <laughs> I think we've benefited from having very like open-minded like producers and managers and stuff, yeah. um, and the teams are smaller as well, so it's a lot more manageable in that way. Yeah, part of what we like how we came about this is like Jed and I were like just doing it on our own, like we didn't actually get team buy-in, we just did it right. Um, and then you can be like, oh hey, this thing is really useful. We're gonna bring it back to the team. Um, yeah, like that's maybe not always doable, but if you can, just. Uh, like it, you can always have a, a chat over lunch or something, right? So. Yeah. Yep. How would you deal with someone who is a bit more difficult to talk to, might be just a bit more quiet or a bit more standoffish or rude? Uh, hmm. That's super hard. <laughs> um, so to what end do you mean? Sorry, for like as part of like the sitting down and just talking kind of thing? Yeah. Oh, right, it's that, hmm. I think uh, that's like communicating, like obviously you, <laughs> you wanna try and be like open and approachable. Like if you're really busy, communicate that, oh, I'm busy today, don't like bother me with these small things. But also saying like, oh, I'm free today. I, like if you have anything, like feel free to come to me. I feel like some of that is addressed in our process as well. Like, um, so like stand-ups and things like that are, like it's dedicated time for everyone to kind of touch base and make sure that everyone is unblocked and able to like help each other out. Um, and that's usually the point where if there is such a like, you know, crazy misalignment of priorities and timing and whatnot, the managers are able to step in and be like, okay, well maybe we'll move things around and make sure that, okay, this dev is able to help this artist or vice versa. Yeah. If you're dealing with someone who's like quite shy and reserved, it can be helpful to like, oh, maybe it, they're not super comfortable one-on-one, -on -one. maybe bring like two or three people in and you can just go around and try to open them up a bit. Um, but it's it's very specific on the person that you're working with. Mm -hmm. What happens if you're working with someone who's just a bit of a dickhead? 
Uh, go to HR. <laughs> yeah, that's the correct answer. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, yeah it's, it's not necessarily your job to fix that, right? Like, there might be an HR person that you could go to or talk to your manager. Yeah. Good questions. Did I need to check that? Is there anything on the app? No, no, no. Nice, nice and easy. So I think we've had time. So remember, everyone, before you implement your ideas and your work, don't forget to export empathy. Thanks, everyone. You'll be great. We <laughs> assume you love it. <laughs> Why am I clapping? I'm so empathetic. So